So hello everyone. I welcome to this uh, session five of SCA theory and evaluation. So we have uh, six talks in this session and uh, the session chairs are Bigul, Srinivas and myself, Sonia. So we will start, start right away with the first talk uh, about a paper called Efficient Private Computations with Code-Based Masking from Weijia Wang, Kierik Meo, Gaëtan Cassier, and François Xavier Standerf, and Weijia will give the talk. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so, so hello, I'm Weijia Wang, currently in at Shen, currently at Shandong University from China. I'm going to present the work related to code-based masking joint with my former colleagues at University of Leuven, uh, Pierre Kumou, Gaetan Kassir, and François Xavier Standard. So masking is one of the most investigated countermeasures uh, countermeasures against the Sentinel attacks. It encodes uh, actually it encodes each circuit into several shares. Boolean masking here uh, is a common type of masking approach. The encoder of Boolean masking uh, ensures that the sum of shares give the circuit. So we can see that this type of masking is quite simple and efficient. But in this work, we consider another type of masking, the code-based masking. Its encoder is more complicated than the Boolean masking. Here, it encodes several uh, circuit variables into shares together by using a linear code. It concatenates here. It concatenates the circuit variable and several random variables into a vector as a message and multiply a mass uh, multiply by a generating matrix here, uh, resulting in a code word, which is a vector of shares. And uh, this is a generalization of many previous masking, such as inner product masking, direct sound masking, and so on. So there are several modes of code-based masking, including the security, fault resistant, and versatility. But despite the merit, there are several challenges to use it. The first challenge should be about the generic private computation applicable to any code-based masking, which is still unknown to the best of our knowledge. And we know that the code-based masking is more complicated, which makes it less efficient than the Boolean masking. So how to reduce the implementation overheads is another challenge. And uh, actually, in this work, we tackle those two challenges by proposing two contributions. Uh, the first, uh, the, the, firstly, we provide a mask demarcation for any code-based masking which respect to any linear code. Uh, secondly, we will show a very nice property of the code-based masking called optimization. So to illustrate the uh, private computation with code-based masking, which is more important component of a masking scheme. So let's here let's we, let's start with the Boolean masking, and we consider the ISW mankation, which is quite famous in the community of the channel countermeasures. So actually, the input are two vector of shares here. Uh, firstly, it computes the output product of the two input shares, resulting in a matrix like this. Uh, then we have to refresh this matrix. Uh, for the sake of security. At last, we just sum the columns of the matrix given uh, several shares as a result. So from this procedure, we can see that uh, this, this scheme uses the uh, first output product, then refresh, then compress strategy. So in our construction, we will generalize uh, this strategy to the code base masking. We also note that the compression of the Boolean masking is quite simple. It's just here it just sum the element of every row. Thanks to the it's thanks to the simple encoder of the Boolean masking. But if we consider the but I mean if we consider the code based masking, the encoder is more complicated here, so which will make the compression becomes more uh, complicated. And based on the based on above iteration, we illustrate the mask modification for the code based masking. First of all, we perform the output product similarly here, uh, the same as Boolean masking, resulting in a matrix like this. 
then we perform the refraction also as a Boolean masking. Then, uh, then we perform uh, then uh, the the I mean after that the compression become different because that the encoder is more complicated. Uh, here we should note that the M1 to M n are fixed matrices and can be pre-computed because uh, based on the linear code. So overall, this mass communication follows the output product, then refresh, uh, then then compress strategy. And the two refreshing here and here uh, provide the deep problem security of the manipulation. And actually the security should be even stronger. It can be DSNI, where the composition of several uh, gadget is also deep problem security. So at last I illustrate the optimization. So let's consider the randomness usage of the Boolean masking and the code base masking. For the SW manipulation of the Boolean masking, it requires this amount of random variables for only one modification, where D is a security order. And for the modification with code based masking, it required this amount, I mean, this number of random variables for K modifications in parallel, where D is a security order and K is a, is a number of modifications, of course. Then, if we consider the number of randomness, uh, variable per manication, the value should be this one versus this one. Uh, we can see that while for if we, I mean while for only one manication, the code base the code base masking may not as efficient as the Boolean masking. But here and here, uh, but if we consider a large value of k, I mean for for uh, for many manications in parallel, if we consider k equals six, sixteen, the code base masking. Uh, may use may generally use less randomness than the Boolean masking. So this is what we refer to as the optimization. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your listening. Thank you. Um, do we have uh, any question on the chat? Uh, I don't see any questions on Zulip chat yet. Okay, so uh, if you want, you have uh, a few more minutes. Uh, to ask questions, so you can either unmute yourself or ask questions on the on Zulip or on the Zoom chat. Uh, in the meantime, I have a, a quick question, Wajja, uh, for you. Um, you said that actually you can be um, more efficient if you have multiplication in parallel, right, uh, for the code-based masking. But did you consider having multiplication in parallel for Boolean masking as well and compare both? Uh, it uh, actually the for the Boolean masking. Uh, I mean, it, I mean, boost, boost, the Boolean masking. The input is uh, shares for only one circuit. So if you have several circuits, you you are doing the Boolean masking several times. Okay. But if you consider the code based masking here, uh, here it's actually encode several circuits together into n shares. So if you do the modification on the, on, the, on the mask domain, then similarly you are doing modifications for several circuits. Okay. Thank you. So, so there's a question by Lauren on uh, Zoom chat. Do you still profit from security amplification if you get a Boolean mask intermediate during the multiplication? Uh, yeah. It's a it's a very nice question. It's it's a good question. So actually, uh, uh, at this, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, we cannot prove the uh, a secured order application during the during the during the modification. It is indeed, but uh, we just we checked several uh, several internal variables inside of the modifications like this. It will give a boolean masking of this without, but. We can see that the shares of at this step will be uh, much larger than d minus one. In this case, we may not have, uh, um, I mean, have a very formal order, uh, order, I mean, secret order amplification, but we have more shares which provide a similar type of security. So it, I mean, we will have somewhat. Uh, uh, better security, and this is a very nice future work, I think. 
So there's a question by Mehdi on Philip uh, uh, chat. Is there time for another question, Sonia? Uh, yeah, we, we can handle one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, are there specific linear codes that are interesting for this construction? For example, uh, because they make the fixed matrices simpler or have a convenient decoding? I think the first, um, uh, uh, I think the first good, uh, the first uh, linear code should be the read assignment code, which provide, which is MDS code, which may provide the smallest number of shares for the largest number of the security order. And we suggest to use the systematic form for the generating matrix now. And we also found that if we use the systematic form of the generating matrix, some uh, some randomness can be, the, I mean here, the randomness of this one can be further reduced. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Weija. We will move to the, now to the second uh, talk of the session. Thank you. So, thank you. So it's a talk on citational countermeasures uh, dissection and the limits of closed source security evaluations. Uh, from Olivier Bronchin and François Xavier Standert, and Olivier will give the talk. Did no? Okay. You see my slides? Yes. We okay. can see. So um, I go on. So why um, men can look at mixed countermeasures? Um, first, because maybe when you do one single countermeasure such as shuffling or masking, maybe it's not enough and you do not get the security you want. So designer can say, okay, no, I will mix uh, multiple countermeasures and I will get higher security. Um, the hope behind that is that you get a multiplication effect between different countermeasures. So if you do masking and shuffling, you hope that by doing some shuffling, you will be able to reduce information on each of the shares. And then um, masking will amplify uh, that gain in terms of, uh, term of noise. However, we do not have many examples of uh, mixed countermeasures, either in implementation or, <clears throat> or uh, in evaluation. So in this work, uh, we look at uh, ANSI protected AES. Um, uh, so it's a code published by the ANSI uh, a bit more than a year ago. Um, it's a 32-bit software implementation and it implements shuffling and masking. Um, in this work, we introduce what we call a countermeasure dissection uh, to analyze the security of, of such uh, protections. And the first step there is to build a prob to, to write a probability distribution. Uh, here we have the expression on the right and th there is many terms. So one term about one of the mask, another term about some permutation and, and another mask, and another term with, once again, um, a share and a permutation. So countermeasure dissection, um, uh, what it is? The goal of that is really to, to reduce the multiplicative effect that the designer hope for down to, um, to a really small factor, which is ideally close to one. Um, if it's close to one, it means that the two countermeasures do not combine at all and we can target them separately. So how do we do that? Uh, in the equation above, we will launch uh, several uh, attacks on, on piece of the secrets. So we can target shares and the permutation independently. So in practice, uh, I will show an example uh, about how to attack uh, the, the permutation that is used in a single trace. So the first step is to uh, measure a trace you get some, you select some point of interest uh, that you had during the profiling phase. You get many samples, um, then we project them to a subspace. And here the different colors you see in the clusters correspond to one different possible permutation. So you get samples, you project them, uh, you project um, in the subspace, and then you can derive a probability uh, that um, given the trace you observe uh, that, that permutation. So if I go back, uh, with my previous equation, um, the multiplicative mask we added with 1% accuracy and same goes uh, for the permutation. So it means that we were able to perform almost a perfect uh, dissection because just by observing a leakage, we were able to completely make ineffective um, masking a permutation, uh, not, uh, multiplicative mask and the permutations because we add them for sure. So, uh, 
if we look at the attacks, uh, we launched divide and conquer attacks uh, by exploiting uh, this observation. And so first, uh, on the 16 bytes, uh, we had just one bit uh, of entropy on each of the bytes with 3,000 traces. Uh, we can also look at the full key uh, and using rank estimation techniques. And there we observe that with 4,000 traces, uh, we got the key for sure. Um, and we can also use some post-processing or uh, key enumeration. And here with 1,100 traces, the key is recovered. And overall, this requires less than one minute of measurements. So in this work on a technical point, we, we've shown attacks on mixed countermeasures uh, that use old techniques. Uh, I mean, PCA and template attacks, they were published more than 10 years ago. Um, it does not show that anti implementation was was wrong or whatever. It just showed to us that protecting 32 bit software uh, is really a difficult task. Uh, what else in this work that I didn't mention uh, here, uh, we, we compare different adversaries that are using machine learning, no machine learning, different attack paths. Uh, so that's for the full paper. And we also lim uh, discuss the limit of closed source uh, evaluation. So can all these steps be automated with, um, with whatever tools? If you want to reproduce that on other targets, you need a few things. So the first thing is that you need to know the source code and you need to know the randomness that is used uh, during the profiling phase. And you need to also have a sufficient understanding of the countermeasures. And finally, as a take home message, I will say thanks to the ANSI uh, for putting uh, that implementation in the wild. Uh, I think it's a nice uh, research challenge um, to evaluate and design more secure implementation. And especially, we realize that uh, T should be able to deal with uh, limited physical noise. So, thanks for listening, and I take any questions. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, do we have any question on this talk? Uh, not on Zulu chat yet, but Francois Xavier has a comment on Zoom chat. Uh, Francois Xavier, do you want to unmute and uh, speak out your comment, or shall I read that, it? That was a comment to Lorenz's previous answer, so it was not related to this talk. Ah. OK, so maybe I have a. a... Oh, there, there is a, a question, I think, on, on Zulip. Yeah, on Zulip, yes, I can read it out uh, by Marios. Can we actually generalize that mixed countermeasures that do not work based on particular experiments? Um, so if I got it correctly, is that, can we implement that? Um, can we use this technique to other mixed countermeasures? I think, um, I think if we do shuffling and, and masking together, this goes well. Um, I mean, if you have uh, countermeasures that are uh, deterministic, this, this fits perfectly. If you have things such that uh, such that uh, noise addition at a physical level, this cannot cope with that. So I hope I answer the question. So Benedict has a question. An important ingredient for SEA countermeasures is hardware induced noise. So not shuffling, etc. So the traces you analyzed have high SNR. They come from a basic embedded microcontroller. How would your method work on very noise, noisy traces? So the point is, uh, for whatever countermeasures you you will implement, so shuffling and masking for both of them, you need noise. The point is, um, and you want to protect these devices. So that that's the point. And either if you want to, so. If you have more noise, for sure, you get better security. But the question is really how to, how to generate noise on these devices. I think, and, and that, that's, I mean, on Cortex M0 to M4, I think there is really low noise. So we should, if we want to protect them, we should be able to, we should be able to generate noise in, in, in some sense on already deployed products. Sonia, do we have time for another question? Uh, yeah, a quick one. Yeah, uh, Marios has a follow-up question. Okay, so, so the question was more on the idea of how much can we generalize your conclusion to other possibilities of mixing protections? I think, 
So the global idea of saying you do not look at the two con of multiple con countermeasure joints Lieben separately can go to, to, to many examples. So if you have a, a masking and on top of that you have, a, I don't know, you have, I don't hear other example than masking and shuffling together. Maybe you, you think you have some SPA protection and you do masking on the top. I, I think we should just look at masking first and then at protection of, again, SPA on, the, uh, on that. If you look at them separately and not jointly, you will be able to, to see if there is a chance to decrease that multiplicative effect that you have between the countermeasures. Yeah. Maybe I could add one way to see that is if, if you try to implement masking and the noise is not sufficient, usually in the literature, you could read here yeah, the option that the natural solution is to add shuffling. What this paper shows is if you don't have noise for masking and add shuffling, shuffling will not help either. So you really need, that, that was then Benedict's question, you need an embedded device with sufficient noise, or we need, need to invent other ways to, to induce this noise. But that's like the, the general conclusion, what is general is if you have no physical noise, all the countermeasures that amplify physical noise, which is masking, shuffling, random delay interrupts, this is not going to help a lot, and this section will work. Okay, thank you, Olivier and François Xavier. I think, yeah, we can move on to the next talk. So let's move to the next talk. Um, author, so the author of papers are Ziyu Zhang, Adam Ying, and Yun Fei. And the talk is on uh, a fast and accurate guessing entropy estimation algorithm for free tools recovery. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yue Zhang. Uh, I am a PhD student from Northeastern University. And it's my honor to introduce our work, a uh, uh, fast and accurate gas entropy estimation algorithm uh, for full key recovery. Uh, the co worker of this work are the Professor Adam Ding and Yun Fei, also from Northeastern University. So, uh, in this five minutes talk, I will mainly talk about our motivation to design such G estimation. Then I will briefly explain our new G estimator, GEA, and uh, show the performance of GEA against empirical GE in one concrete example. Uh, for more theoretical proof and uh, all the other stuff, please watch the uh, presentation video on the YouTube or directly read our paper. So as we know, G is the average of two key ranks across multiple uh, attacks uh, with fixed number of measurements. G is commonly taken as an evaluation metric because G measures the average computational cost for a successful ch set channel attack. More specifically, a higher G value means more wrong keys are likely to be checked before the attacker reaching the correct key. So before our GA algorithm, G was commonly estimated empirically. Uh, that is the attacker were launched on, uh, attack were launched on multiple data sets and the true key rank is found, is found on each data set. The average rank across these data sets is the empirical GE. However, such estimation has two main challenges in the multi bytes case. Uh, so first challenge is that the computation of, uh, of a true key ranks in multi bytes case is slow, even with state of art ranking algorithms. Uh, what's more, the estimation itself is often too uncertain to illustrate this, we target an AES-128 encryption in our example. In order to estimate G empirically, we computed 2,000 ranks for each Q value, where the Q value is the number of traces in one set channel attack. And as you can see from the figure that the 95% uh, confidence interval of the empirical G is often too loose to be useful. So let's uh, focus on when Q equals to 50K. Uh, actually the upper bound of the empirical G is two to the power of 44.2. Well, the lower bound is only one. Well, and G value of one uh, represents a serious threat, right? And the value above two to the power of 40 is not realistically enumerable. And an attack in this case, well, with the power of, with G uh, of the power of uh, 44.2 is unrealistic. So with such a wide confidence interval, the evaluator cannot tell if the target device is safe or not. 
But using our method for the same Q value, we got a much tighter uh, confidence interval uh, with the lower bound two to the power of uh, 32.6 and uh, upper bound uh, two to the power of 41.9, which allowed the evaluator to better judge the seriousness of a side channel attack threat. Notice that the empirical GE value actually falls outside of a confidence interval, showing how unreal, uh, unreliable the empirical GE is. So how did we get a faster and less variable um, estimation of GE uh, uh, for GE? So in a GA algorithm, instead of sampling over the two key ranks, we estimate GE based on the theoretical distributions of ranking score vectors. Uh, crucially, we relate GE to the sum of pairwise success rates, which allows us to calculate GE from the sum of univariate uh, Gaussian uh, probabilities instead of from a multivariate uh, Gaussian probability. We also show in our work that GE can be applied to not only traditional side channel attacks, such as template attack, but also to more recent DN based side channel attacks. Our GA can predict GE for any Q values and uh, in a more accurate and efficient way than other G estimators. And more importantly, it is currently the only practical, reliable full GE uh, evaluation tool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that is all. And uh, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm looking at Zulip. I see a question on how scalar is this method beyond 16 by keys? Uh, did you try a full key attack evaluation for very large keys, for example, one color sample? Okay, so so for a very large key, actually when a number of bytes succeeds, like for example, like three bytes, it is actually impossible uh, to enumerate over the key space beyond, beyond that, right? So in, instead of calculate the exact number of uh, G, as the, uh, G value, which basically we need to enumerate over the, the whole, the full key space, we're, uh, we're gonna doing sampling on the, the, the big key space. So the accuracy of uh, such estimation basically is directly related to the number of sample uh, to, uh, for the estimation, right? Just like the empirical G. So uh, based on our investigation, uh, the more bytes involved in the key lens, uh, the bigger variance you got for, for you to estimate uh, an accurate G estimation. So that means you need to sample more, do, do more samplings. But uh, the good thing is, um, if you're gonna if you're gonna estimate a key, uh, directly estimate a specific key rank for a large size key, it's gonna take more time. But for our GA method, we're only sampling the probabilities. While sam sam the calculation of probabilities is basically using a constant time for any key length. So that is another advantage over the empirical GE that it is still possible to actually estimate GE for an even longer key length. Okay. So the follow-up question by Marios, I can read it out. So I was wondering in uh, scalability, not more than three bytes, but over 512 bytes. Did you try any experiments over 16 bytes? Also, what about memory overhead? Okay, so uh, if I, if, uh, can you repeat the question again? I don't think I fully understand that question. Okay. Uh, I was uh, wondering in scalability, not more than three bytes, but over 512 bytes. So did you try any experiments over 16 bytes? Also, what about memory overhead? Oh, oh okay. So actually, uh, we don't try any uh, uh, key bytes lines more than 16 bytes, but, uh, but we actually did a kind of experiment to check the, uh, uh, the st stability of our GA estimation. Uh, so the thing is, we try to decrease the number of sample uh, for uh, 
sticking byte key. So it's more like uh, either you increase the number of bytes or you decrease the number of sampling, right? Uh, when we decrease the number of sampling, the GA uh, estimation is still see a show very good stability in the estimation. So I would uh, I would anticipate that we can still uh, uh, we can still got a kind of stable estimation for a longer uh, key lens, but uh, uh, we didn't do such experiment yet. Uh, we can try in a uh, in the future work. And uh, the, for the memory thing is the, the number of uh, the memory uh, usage is directly related to the number of sampling. So, uh, however, like when you compute the probabilities uh, in, in the sampling uh, process, it barely takes some uh, uh, memory, uh, memory space, uh, which is uh, at least is, is uh, much smaller than the uh, you need to calculate one specific rank. That is, the thing. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the answer. Um, thank you. I don't see any other questions. So I think we can move to the next talk, the first talk of the session. Um, that will be on modeling soft analytical site and attacks from coding for your point of view. So the presentation will be given by Champion. The floor is yours. Hi. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Chen, and uh, this is joint work with Wasound, Francois Sauer, and uh, Olivier. Uh, so we start with side channel analysis. One famous uh, type of side channel analysis is differential power analysis. Uh, we also call it divide and conquer. And uh, today we focus on soft uh, analytic side channel side channel attacks, SASCA, this is a more recent uh, one. So I suggested by making, by masking secure proofs, all the leakage samples in an implementation can be exploited. The question is, is this true? So for divide and conquer approach, definitely is not because only leakages from the first and last rounds of block cipher can be exploited. But the divide conquer approach has the advantage that it allows very simple evaluation. But Saska situation is much better because it is very powerful and it is nearly worst case attack. But Saska has a problem that it's hard for security evaluation. You have to run the attack to know its performance. So the difficulty, this difficulty is two faults. Uh, from one side, attack results can be heuristic and, and depend on the circuit representation. For instance, if, uh, if you have a circuit with uh, many small cycles, then the result will not converge or converge to a wrong value. Uh, on the other hand, the information propagation can be quite slow because it may take uh, uh, this complexity for an n-bit XOR. So this complexity is already very high for us, uh, not very high, but high for asserted two-bit devices. So in this paper, we propose a new model called local random probability model, LRPM, to bound the efficiency of SASCA. So this model allows fast security evaluation of SASCA. And uh, this model allows fast evaluation of uh, actual implementations uh, of uh, masking and uh, shuffling. So uh, this is uh, uh, every SASCA start with a factor graph. And uh, this is a simple example. So we have variable nodes and we have uh, uh, functionals or check nodes, there are leakages associated with the, these variable nodes. So we start with the leakage and after this information propagation, we hope that for this, uh, uh, for this variable node, the accumulated uh, mutual information could be higher uh, than or, or close to one, then we can determine this uh, secret key. So we need to design local information propagation rules. For variable nodes, it's quite simple, it's just some the input uh, mutual information values. It's similar to measuring information from independent traces in the uh, divide and conquer approach. But for function, uh, for, for function nodes, it's uh, kind of complicated and we choose to uh, compute the product. So this is uh, some idea from borrowed from coding theory. 
is that we, we approximate the probability distribution uh, by a distribution from a culinary erasure channel. So in the output, on the output edge, we will also observe an er erasure channel. Then uh, by coding theory, we know that the channel capacity can be bounded by this value. So we use this value to bound the, uh, the mutual information leakage that we can get from the output edge. So for the previous simple example, we can see that the security in the LRPM model may, uh, could decrease linearly with the circuit size. But this is just a very small uh, example. And the later we show that with the AES and the non plain text scenario, uh, it is not true. And digging beyond few rounds is useless. So now we go to the evaluation result for AES. And uh, we see that generally the model prediction matches experiments and uh, are conservative, and the evaluation is uh, much faster. So uh, we show the leakage bound, and this is leakage bound and success rates of experimental, su experimental SASCA in a known plain text scenario. So we consider uh, two, for up to two rounds. So we consider TA, one round SASCA, and two round SASCA. And also we think uh, this Hamming weight leakage model and the random leakage model, uh, the result shows that the attack complexity is independent of the shape of the leakage functions. Then we consider a high noise case, higher noise case. Uh, and uh, we see that improvement of SASCA over TA is independent of the noise. So this is particularly relevant in practice because we can compute this uh, gain by, by, these, by the models. And then if we do simulation for, for TA, then we can get a good estimation for SASCA uh, in the in experiments. So we also do the experiments in a no, unknown plain text scenario and do uh, up to 10 rounds. We see that for this unknown plain text scenario, leakages from all the rounds are very helpful. So, uh, this model also allows efficient evaluation for the protected implementations such as masking and shuffling. We refer the interest readers to the paper for details, and uh, uh, I just show some results for mask multiplication. So uh, observations are quite similar to the one obtained from horizontal attacks. For high north regime, we see the impact of order. So high order masking uh, see, uh, means that uh, higher order security, uh, better security, but uh, in the low noise region, we can take advantage of from partial products. So this uh, higher uh, order masking case may have less secure, uh, maybe less secure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions? I don't see any question on Zulip chat or Zoom chat. Okay, and you can always write on the Zoom chat or, or speak out if you have any questions. So then can we move on to the next uh, talk, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the next talk is titled On the Spectral Features of Robust Probing Security. So it's a joint work by Maria Chiara Moltini and Vittorio Zakaria. Maria will be presenting the topic. Hi, everyone. Hi, Maria Chiara. And I'm going to present a web paper titled On the Spectral Features of Robust Probing Security. Um, our uh, work uh, addresses uh, uh, the problem security, as I'm going to explain briefly now. Uh, we have a circuit handling some uh, secrets uh, and an attacker that tries uh, to recover some information about these secrets, placing one or more probes on the wires in this uh, circuit. So the main aim of our work is to give uh, some uh, uh, mathematical formalization in uh, the context of a probe security when glitches are taken into account. 
Uh, here in this slide, there are some uh, definitions about uh, province security. In particular, we call robust uh, the province security analyzed when some physical defaults happen, uh, for example, glitches, that can give some additional information to an attacker. And uh, in this context, uh, the probes are called extended. Um, our um, theoretical method is uh, based on uh, the theory of the Boolean functions, uh, and uh, in particular, we exploit uh, the Walsh matrices and um, uh, their properties. And we are able to define uh, the vulnerability profile of a function, but mostly the vulnerability profile of a composition of functions. Uh, giving some rules uh, to verify if uh, this composition is uh, secure or not. We also define a classification of extended probes uh, to deal uh, with uh, the hardware gadgets composability. To explain our method in this uh, short presentation, um, I present a very simple example. Here in this slide, uh, there is a Boolean function and uh, its relation matrix. The relation matrix of a function in com is uh, computed from uh, the Walsh matrix, uh, substituting any non-zero element by one. So in this, uh, in this matrix, uh, we can note uh, here that uh, the XOR between the two outputs, uh, od zero and one, are correlated to the XOR between alpha zero and alpha one. And this is highlighted uh, uh, by this uh, pink circle in the, in the matrix. So we define the compact representation of a relation matrix uh, as uh, its reshaping by compacting the spectral coefficients, uh, taking into account only the number of shares of each uh, original variable. So in this slide, uh, there is the compact representation of uh, the relation matrix in the slide before. And um, the, um, the information given by the pink circle in the um, slide before, in the matrix in the slide before, now are given by this uh, blue circle. So we can note that this uh, matrix is uh, much smaller than a Walsh matrix, so um, more handling when uh, we are uh, working with composition of functions. Uh, but at this end of this, uh, Give us, gives us uh, all the information that we need uh, to define uh, the um, security of a function. Here in this slide, uh, there is our classification of extended probes um, with some informal definitions. So an extended probe could be pure or composed and uh, output or internal. We also apply our theoretical method to some uh, well-known multiplication gadgets. Uh, the consolidating masking scheme and the domain-oriented masking with independent shares. We analyze it both and also we give some improvements to the CMS scheme. Uh, here in this presentation, I'm, um, on, I'm uh, presenting uh, briefly only some, um, uh, some, what, some things that uh, we did uh, about the CMS scheme. So uh, from literature, we know that the CMS uh, is not robust, the probe insecure for d greater or equal to three. And we analyze that uh, through our um, uh, classification of extended probes. So our first solution is to, uh, to, to, um, to allow the CMS to reach the strong, pro the, pro the robust the probe insecurity is to um, um, exploit the non-completeness property. And uh, in this slide, there is an example when d is equal to three. Uh, and um, through the compact correlation matrix, uh, we can um, verify that uh, this scheme is robust, free probe insecure, but not still robust, free strong non interfering. And uh, we can note this um, uh, thanks to these uh, red circles. Uh, so, for example, uh, this one says us uh, that uh, two internal probes and one output give us uh, information about um, uh, three shares of a secret. So, this says us uh, that uh, this scheme is uh, not strong non-interfering. So, our second solution is to add some, uh, some randoms in this scheme to reach the this strong non-interference. Um, this is an example when d is equal to three, and we add in the, at this schema four randoms 
that are uh, um, the random the, the, the red variables uh, in this figure. Through the compact correlation matrix, uh, uh, we can now verify that um, uh, this scheme is a robust free strong run inter interfering. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, for your talk. Uh, we have a question on Zoom chat. Do you want me to read it? Or? Yes, Sonia, yes, please. Okay, so we have a, a question from you again, Ilkus. So he's complimenting your video and, uh, and your paper. And he says that being mathematician at electrical engineering, he has problems understanding your definitions of pure and composed extended probe. A non-extended probe is a function mapping the inputs and randoms to the values observed at a wire. An extending probe is a set of probes and can be identified with the linear span of these probes. Is your definition of pure probe equivalent to the set of probes being linear independent? So um, I can describe uh, uh, what is a pure probe or a composite probe. A pure probe is a probe placed on a wire in, a, in the circuit that can um, um, give us information about all the inputs that uh, compute the um, uh, value flowing in that wire. And composite probe generally is a probe placed after a composition of probes. So uh, it can give us only information about the XOR of uh, the input variables, or uh, for example, uh, input variables that are masked by some randoms. So um, this is a um, uh, um, definition. It's not the same of extended probes. So this is a um, kind of uh, extended probes. And generally, a probe and generally a probe could be pure or composite, and uh, a put or internal. So, for example, uh, a pure uh, internal probe is a probe placed uh, a pure probe placed. Uh, on an internal wire. But they are good. So I do not see any other question. Uh, so let's thank Maria again. Thank you. So, so let's move uh, to the next stop, please. So the next work is titled Unrolled Cryptography and Silicon, a Physical Security Analysis by Thorburn Moose. Okay, hi and welcome everybody uh, to my short five minute presentation. It's the last one for today. Um, I'm presenting the paper Unrolled Cryptography on Silicon, a Physical Security Analysis. So what is the motivation for our work? I believe Ingrid said it yesterday already in the first Ask Me Anything session. Uh, masking for latency circuits is still something that we are not very advanced at as a research community. It's, it's unknown how to best protect a full cipher by a masking scheme and still make it executable in one or a very few clock cycles. There certainly are some options out there, but, but most of them have very large area or randomness demands for a full cipher. The problem is simply that glitch resistance itself typically requires synchronization stages and synchronization stages means that the execution of the circuit takes more cycles. Um, because of this very challenging nature of low latency circuits, we thought it would be interesting to explore what the physical security properties of an unprotected unrolled circuit really is when implemented in realistic hardware. So which attacks are straightforward, which attacks are not so trivial and can we maybe achieve at least some basic protection at a low cost without any masking scheme. Yes, sorry. Um, so what we did is we implemented a dedicated low latency primitive, namely the Prince block cipher in a fully unrolled manner on a test chip, which you can see on this slide. Um, it's a test chip in, in 40 nanometer technology and we evaluated the physical security of the Prince core with respect to power analysis attacks. 
And when I say power analysis attacks here, I mean both the dynamic and the static power consumption of the target, because for this kind of implementation, these both side channels have very different characteristics. The dynamic leakage, for example, is fully transitional. So without any transition in the input, the circuit has no dynamic dissipation because nothing is updated. The static leakage, on the other hand, is fully based on, on the values that are stable and applied to the gates of the circuit, so it's completely value-based. The difference is even more amplified here because the switching behavior of an unrolled primitive is vastly dominated by glitches. So more than 90% of all transitions in the circuit are glitches and, in fact, unnecessary for the computation of the correct output. Unfortunately, I do not have the time to present all our results um, of the experimental analysis here, but the most important observations are the following. First of all, when an adversary can observe the processing of consecutive plain text under the same key and the circuit is not being reset in between the encryptions, then simple first round attacks work easily because you can easily predict a transition between two first round values of consecutive encryptions. However, depending on how you perform a reset of the circuit between encryptions, and we have tested several different methods in that regard, which are all listed in this table, you can make the life of adversaries much more difficult. In particular, when setting the plain text input of the circuit to a fresh freshly random value between each encryption, um, then extracting a significant part of the first round key becomes very difficult. In our example, even 100 million traces did uh, allow recovery of only two key nibbles of the first round key. Another observation is that the signal to noise ratio of dynamic power measurements is only really high for the first round input and not for the later rounds of the cipher, which means it is extremely hard to perform attacks on an unrolled primitive on the last round, which means if you have access to the cipher text instead of the plain text. Um, I, I guess that could be used in certain modes of operation and similar. Um, when observing the static power consumption, on the other hand, it allows you to extract much more information, namely about all stable intermediate values uh, of the whole cipher execution. They're in the circuit at the same time, and you cannot target just one specific round, but you can perform a text from the plain text and the cipher text side in the same manner as you are used to, for example, in a round-based implementation. Um, the signal-to-noise ratio for all 12 round inputs confirms this ob uh, observation. It's, it's much higher in the later rounds when measuring the static power consumption instead of uh, one of the dynamic scenarios that we have investigated in this work. They are more detailed in the longer presentation and also in the paper. Um, a reset of the circuit after each encryption provides still protection against static power adversaries as well but only if control over the clock signal is not a possibility for the adversary. And if you perform the reset right after each encryption and not just sometime before the next one is uh, yeah, processed. So in summary, I believe the paper gives a few good hints on, on what to do and what not to do in order to protect a fully unrolled primitive against both power side channels at a pretty low cost. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Torben, for the talk. Uh, Sonia, do you see any questions? Uh, I don't see any question yet, uh, neither on, on, the repo, on the Zoom chat. So we can just wait a few moments, hoping for questions. In the meantime, let me let me jump in with a question. So the analysis you performed was in two sides, I understand. Like on the one hand, you performed TVLA and you you tried uh, CPA DPA. Do I understand correctly, Torban? I, I didn't fully get the first part, but yeah, we did TVLA and CPA DPA. Um, do you think more elaborate analysis uh, in a way that uh, by fixing the inputs per se in a certain manner that will reduce the glitching for certain implementations, would they um, lead to lower resistance in a way? 
Yes, absolutely. So this is also detailed in the paper more, more specifically. Um, if you change in, in your input only, if you have control over the plain text and mm -hmm. have a chosen plain text scenario, you can fix all but one key nibble, for example, all but one input nibble, for example, and then you have a higher um, signal to noise ratio for the first rounds, but still not for the later rounds, because I mean, the difference in the input propagates pretty fast because it's a cipher and not just any circuit. Um, but yeah, for the first, second, maybe third round of text, this would be uh, definitely helpful. Okay. There are other questions that I see. Um, one is from Ingrid asking, what is the logical depth of the unrolling and what technology did you use? Um, so it's a 40 nanometer technology, a low power technology. I don't know the depths out of my head, but I could look it up sometime. So if you want to come back to me with that question, then I, I, I'm able to answer that. Um, it is on the loop if you want to turn back to Ingrid at a later time. Um, yeah, yeah I, I cannot uh, find it out on the fly, so I have to look in the simulations. OK. And we do have another question from uh, Benedict, uh, who says that perhaps he missed the conclusion, uh, can we protect an old crypto implementations? Yes, I mean, um, low latency hardware masking is a thing that, that, that's certainly coming in the future. There's also a talk by, uh, by, by my colleague Pascal on Friday, I guess. Um, but independent of that, I think these reset methods, if you apply them correctly and you have take care that the adversary cannot control the clock because it's generated on silicon and has a good connection and some, some protection against, I don't know, more invasive attacks. Um, then certainly it works, yeah, and it's it's pretty cheap. You have to randomly preload the circuit between each encryption, and you get like pretty good protection against basic attacks, right? So definitely, with more sophisticated attacks, you would be able to to extract some some more information. But I don't know how much more. So I would encourage everybody to to try it themselves. I, I know that on FPGA it's a bit more difficult because everything is slower and consumes more current and is larger, so the text will be easier. On ASIC it's definitely it's it's more difficult. I mean this unrolled core it takes less than five nanoseconds, so it can operate at 200 megahertz, and in each clock cycle a new plain text is processed. And Lauren has a question. Uh, so we don't need masking? Yeah, it depends. I mean, this kind of security, it doesn't give you any guarantees, right? So it's more of an intuition. And if you if you have just an experimental analysis, it, it still depends on the security levels that you desire. And it depends on um, your, your specific hardware. So it's not directly transferable that you don't need masking for uh, unrolled circuits. But if I had to implement for a company right now an unrolled circuit, I would rather go for resetting it to random value than going for applying some masking that we have in the state of the art. So I don't see any other question. So let's thank Torben again and all the speakers of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this concludes all the technical sessions of the day. So now it's party time.